it's a really strange day actually because this is the first day on Harry Potter 7 where we're saying goodbye to characters who've been with the series right from the very beginning. It was Richard, Fiona and Harry's last scene of the film and they were the first people who'd been on it the whole way through to actually finish. This isn't just goodbye, boy, is it? This is farewell. Me and Harry and, and Fiona and Richard, we all started together 10 years ago and in the last 10 years, I then have since gone on to do stage work with Richard and Harry is actually on stage at the moment with Fiona doing Mother Courage at the National. So it's quite a nice sort of journey that that family has been on off screen as well as on. <laughs> Somebody has to pay for the frustration, dear. <laughs> the Dursley stuff was the very first stuff ever that was shot at all. I never thought for a minute it would span 10 years. I mean, I was a redhead when I started. And, uh, and Dan Radcliffe was about this big. He was like a bewildered little schoolboy. What's been, of course, very exciting is seeing the children grow from children into these splendid adults, actually. They're, they're a very nice bunch. Oh my God. <laughs> don't, don't just ignore those terrible people. I was just going to say about what they're terrible people. They should never be on any cameras. <laughs> we kind of kept the relationship going which has been so nice and and from an, you know from an acting perspective you know Fiona's helped me so much um, and so has Richard and Dan as well just kind of being with these people to constantly inspire you. I've enjoyed Harry Melling and I visit with Richard Griffiths whenever we meet and he tells me whatever stories he's accumulated in the time he's a brilliant brilliant raconteur so a lot of our life is spent in tents listening to Richard's fantastic stories <laughs> so I, I will miss that. Well, Richard was always very keen that there'd be a series called The Dirties, Dirties and yes. we're, we're still standing by. <laughs> you know, I have known them since I was 10 and now being 20 it has been a huge part of my life and something that hopefully I haven't taken for granted. This is farewell. I mean, this is forever. I miss them immensely. Flight from Privet Drive is a thrilling ride and has been a really complex logistical challenge, not just from a visual effects point of view, but from a stunts point of view, from locations, from design, all coming together. We've got seven bikes in total. How are you doing, my wee pal? I'm good, man. How are you? This is the Hagrid's bike from uh, movie number seven. It's modelled on the bike that we used on the first Harry Potter film. We've basically dressed the whole thing up to look like a 60s bike and a 60s sidecar, so there's an awful lot of work being done on the sidecar, reshaping it, remodelling it. I have to say, it would be a wonderful way to travel in a sidecar. I love being in that. I'm yet to travel more than about three metres in it, but those three metres were some of the fun I, funnest I've ever had. It was great, I loved it. It'd be a great way to come to work in the mornings. For all the motorbikes in the opening sequence, we've got um, a number of requirements. We've got uh, stunt motorbikes, which involved uh, trains, wire rigs, and the ability to fly a motorbike. And we've got the motorbike that has to turn upside down in the tunnel. But for that, we had to build uh, a motorbike that we could roll upside down with somebody on it. And it has to be, obviously, a stunt person. Dan has to be able to fall out of the sidecar and hang underneath it. A lot of the stunts in this scene have been done by Mark Maley, who's my stunt double, who's fantastic. And he was going through the Dartford Tunnel in England, he was standing up on a, in the sidecar of a motorbike going at sort of 40 miles an hour. I would love to be able to take the credit for it, but unfortunately I can't. Mark's been doing great work for me. And also a plus side of having Mark um, doubling you is that he's legendary for having a very, very nice bump. And, uh, and it's great because he's doubling me in this scene. I've turned out looking very, very good as it turns out. Uh, the most complicated, I would probably say, is the motorbike chasing, and uh, basically that involved going 
in between traffic at quite high speeds. I think we were doing around 30 to 40 miles an hour. So that's really, really exciting and very different to do. This is day three in the Liverpool Queensway Tunnel. It's more practical to film in a four-lane tunnel because we can get cameras, cars, other vehicles in a four-lane tunnel, and then we create a CG wall for the two-lane tunnel. On top of that, we've got the crash where they land at the burrows in the end. Um, and for that, we're building a, a motorbike that can crash into the reed bed, into the water, with somebody on it and somebody in the sidecar. It's, it's similar to a, sort of a sort of a log flume ride. We get a big, big plume of water as we go into it. The thing I'm most proud of is that the, the work that we've done blends together so seamlessly that a lot of people don't realise that it's a practical effect or it's a visual effects effect because they just accept it that that's the story on the screen. That's what we're trying to achieve and I think that's what we've done. The wedding started with a tent, and Stuart is absolutely passionate about tents, so he thought it complemented the exterior of the burrow. We've done a few tents, but then when you go back as far as we do, you, we've done quite a lot of everything, actually. The wedding tent is, is I hope, rather beautiful. It isn't a modern contemporary tent. It's very Edwardian in its, uh, in its shape and its silhouette, and rather elegant. Take two. David's didn't want stripes, they wanted a plain colour. So we ended up with the whole thing built up with the exterior of the burrows being painted purple and the tent being a sort of pale grey with purpley hustles and trimming and a purple carpet. It is very elegant and it looks beautiful. You know, they've got the gorgeous the lights that hover and the tables look good. It is definitely a French influence. I'm Mr. Weasley. Oh, what's on there? Oh, It's really quite exciting. It actually feels like, like a party, really, in there. It's, it's a great set. You can get going on the tent. Tent? Protego Total. Where am I supposed to find a tent? There's a very modest little tent that the three heroes journey throughout this film in, and it is supposed to be that tent from the World Cup in Harry Potter 4. Home to be told. We had established the size of the exterior tent in the fourth film, but the interior is different. We didn't have the ritzy lining that we had in the World Quidditch tent. Did, did you think we were going to be staying in a five-star hotel? That was just a very simple set indeed, actually, and uh, Eduardo Sarah photographed it beautifully. The lighting is very beautiful, very subtle varied from day to night and season to season. It's amazing how, how much, yeah, richness and interest you can get out of a couple of sheets of canvas, basically. I get it. <laughs> New set, new problems, new fun, and it's bigger than normal. <laughs> Today is the all-night cafe where um, Harry, Ron, and Marnie think they've got away from the Death Eaters. The Death Eaters appear, and a big wand fight ensues. They were always given a, a sequence or a general scene, and they say we want some kind of wand fighting. So. We try and put together some kind of duel. All right, so let's just go through a half-speed rehearsal, guys. The cafe scene was quite complicated because it was quite a timing issue. Hermione comes up out from behind her hiding place, goes down, waits a few beats, comes up and goes down again, and it was trying to get the movements exactly right, plus explosions going on in your face. We're <laughs> 
yourself, Frank. It's a, it's a totally visual thing that you have to make up. It's, you can't actually see the spell. That's something I'll be adding in later. If you're doing a, a sword fight routine, you use the swords and you, and you can connect. But when you're actually doing a wand fight, you're not actually connecting with anything. So that makes it difficult. We do have to rehearse things and, and set them out. People visualising their minds. If you're being blasted by a wand spell, you're going to take a hit and you're going to go back violently, which happens with most of the spells. There are occasions where a spell might hit somebody in the shoulder, so it's, it's very similar to when we do bullet hits on films. We'll just react with, it, with their shoulder and, and, and then just carry on fighting. We always go all out, put everything into it, and then we can always bring it back slightly. Because if you half do something, it just doesn't look real, you know, so you have to kind of throw yourself in. Yeah. So it's almost like you've got to make that really far. Do you know what I mean? And then, and then with that hint. Yeah. Being more critical, and I think the better you can give the public a, a real, a real performance, I think the more, the more you get back from them. We've heard some crazy things fill in for whatever the creature's supposed to be. You know, sticks, tennis balls, dots, numbers. You know, it's different every time. Uh, we have to be quite careful, though, because sometimes it gets a bit absurd and then you just start laughing and you can't really take it seriously. Action. It's quite a weird concert, really, just to kind of react to something that's not there at all, um, especially when it's quite a, quite an animated kind of thing, like Dobby. I'm, I'm Jason. Go ahead. Well, you need to move to your left a little. OK. Blocking yeah. Dobby. Oh. Well, like I'm talking about. Yeah, I know what you was here, but we... I know what you're saying. Okay. They've really changed the way they do that now. They've got these doubles to stand in for, for these creatures and, and do the lines, so you're actually, you're actually talking to a person. I've had to supply some people today to uh, to kind of be doubles stroke stand-ins for Dobby and Creature, uh, which is quite interesting. Just come over here. Well, I just want to try, um, anti grab you guys. Yeah. Ah! Ah! Yeah. <laughs> because, of course, also we've got not only the short actor in there, we've also got somebody else providing the voice of the character, so they're working as a team. Uh, uh, uh. Ah. Dobby? I enjoy playing Dobby. That said, I never really take full credit for the character since it's... A large part of its character comes from its movement, which I can only suggest and they can realise. When I did it in the second film, it was very much me in a sound studio working with the film that had already been shot with a ping pong ball on a stick, which was going to be me, and offering up suggestions, you know, how he might move, how Dobby might move. Whereas this time, Diane, my collaborator, comes on and she's closer to the size of Dobby. So she then gives a scale to, to what I've suggested and proposed. I'm Dobby, it's all the moves, isn't it? Because he's a creature, but I'm better, because I'm younger. He's the nicer one. Yeah, you're the horrible one. I'm the grumpy, old, he's miserable the one, isn't he? git. That's grumpy me. Old. Oh, yeah, we're really enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're really brilliant. It allows David Yates to sort of direct the whole scene with all the integral parts. Yeah, you're right. And you want me to notate this in my head? Take me a little moment just to re retain what he's saying. Again, that would be correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the past, you would shoot the stuff with, with nothing in there, and it's harder to perhaps get sort of real interactions between the live action performers and the 3D characters and create a, an electricity between the two elements. Do you need me to vocalise at all? Now that the performers act in the scene, I think you get a, a far more vibrant 
exchange from the live-action actors and, and gives you a more potent sequence. Who was that creature? Mandungus. Mandungus Fletcher. If you can have another actor on set to interact with, I mean, it, it helps your performance no end. And, you know, hopefully when the audience sits down to watch the film, it will be a seamless character interacting with the actors and prove to be very realistic. Uh, Harry Potter. Uh, uh. I've played some wonderful characters throughout the whole series of films. Swish and flick, everyone. In the first film, I played Professor Flitwick and also the Goblin Bank Teller. Does Mr. Harry Potter have his key? And then, as the films have gone on again, I played Flitwick, and now in the final film, I'm able to play Grip Hook as well. The role of Grip Hook was something that I always had at the back of my mind. Boy, I'd love that character. There is no place safer than Gringotts. Griphook has so much more depth to him that I've ever been able to get into my work as Professor Flitwick. And so I went in and read for David Yates and our casting director and gave him a best shot. David left a message to tell me that I had the part. And it was funny, I was sort of in shock. and just sat there for a minute. It was like, great, OK, here we go. The journey commences. Better, because I haven't had a chance to suss it out properly then. That's why I wanted, yeah. I suppose I'm stretching my my acting muscles a little bit farther than I have been able to in previous films, because uh, he's a very much darker character and quite a multi-layered character. What we're going to do is we're going to put a ball cap on you, um, and Adrian's going to do that, and he's also, he'll be the nose man, so he's going to watch your nose at all times. Great. And we'll ask you all the way through it if you're okay, and it's thumbs up, not thumbs too up. high, because of okay. nothing. <laughs> um, what signals like if I want that I'm thirsty? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> The makeup is obviously a very important part of what I do and the creation of that character. It's not just down to me, it's a team effort to bring him to the screen. We're doing a makeup test on Warwick Davis, because he's all we could get at short notice. <laughs> and um, for Grip Hook. With Grip Hook, we looked at what we did on the first picture with the film Troyer. He had a particular look, so we took that look and we transpose that look onto Warwick. Contrary to, uh, to popular belief, I don't look like a goblin in real life. <laughs> so uh, without all of this and without these two here and all the other people that go to put the makeups together, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do because I don't look right. I, I'm too good looking. <laughs> Makeup is only so good up to the point where a guy's got to operate it with his facial muscles and work through it and everything. It's, it's for example, I know my own face, so I know, you know, if I raise an eyebrow, how that looks basically. But on the character makeups, you have to learn kind of how much of an eyebrow raise you have to do for it actually to read and register as an eyebrow raise on the character's makeup, for example. So. That's kind of what I'm still learning about. When you get somebody who really can use a makeup, can perform it, your work just improves and improves and improves. And so I've been very fortunate working with Warwick. It is important you don't rely on the makeup. You've got to find that character within you. But then to have gone through three hours of makeup and then stand in front of the mirror and see yourself transform, it, it, it's a wonderful feeling. And um, you know, I feel very privileged to be able to, to kind of portray these characters that I have in these films. Hello. Ready for the office. <laughs> <laughs>